Thank you so much for joining us here today at The Dwelling Show. Um, I've got a legend today and I'm super excited. I've got a massive grin on my face. For those listening in, um, we've got Brian Burke. is like one of the biggest and bestest um, apartments in the Kettles here in the United States. And I'm just like, just so pumped to talk to you. Thank you so much for being here, Brian. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. So, um, Brian, I mean, I have a long list, um, you know, of intro, but I, I'm pretty sure you can do a better job than I can in terms of saying our, our dual listeners a little bit more about yourself and kind of what you've been up to lately. Yeah, well, you know, I started investing in real estate uh, about 29 years ago. Uh, so it's, it's been a little, it's been a short career so far, but I got more to go. Uh, I started out in single family, like a lot of people, you know, that, uh, you know, or trying to figure out how to get started, just doing one one house at a time. Uh, I did that for a couple decades, and then uh, when the market collapsed here in California in 2006, just really started to grow our business and doing a lot more single family homes because there was a lot of single family homes to be done. Uh, but to do that, we started raising a lot of money, <clears throat> and as uh, as we started raising money and figuring out, like, you know wow, we're really getting good at bringing in a lot of money for, uh, to buy foreclosed real estate, but what's going to happen when there's no more foreclosed homes to buy and fix up? Uh, what are we going to do next? And, you know, I had done some multifamily uh, previously and, uh, and realized that that really was the business that was going to be scalable uh, and sustainable over the long term. So that became the primary focus here uh, at Praxis was uh, multifamily syndications across the country. Uh, began doing that in 2008, uh, and and the rest is kind of history, as they say. Uh, we've done a couple thousand uh, units since. We'll probably uh, closed on, I think, at least 500 units this year. It looks like we did about 500 units last year. Next year, hopefully, we'll do about a thousand. Uh, you know, we're we're trying to double. Uh, this year's production next year and, and making some good progress towards doing that. So uh, that's really what we've been up to. You know, we've raised um, about $90 million from investors uh, and uh, bought 735 properties in the last 29 years. So it's been a little bit busy. Wow. That's a, that's a, there's a lot to, to kind of unpack in there. Um, and just for the dual listeners, I've been doing a, like a, a ton of research. Um, I, I mean, I follow everything Brian says. I research, you know, Praxis Capital, Brian's company. So I really, I have some interesting questions, right? People listening in today would think like, wow, this, you know, Brian is huge, is big, but you actually started really small. Right. And I, I want us to go back a little bit. I know you're, you know, you're from California, you grew up in Los Angeles. So can you tell us kind of like how you started? I think you were like 20 years ago when you started, just give us like that story so folks can connect. Cause people think, wow, it's so big. It, like brand is so big. I can't even phantom. Right. But kind of walk us through that journey. Yeah. You know, if, uh, if you were talking to me, uh, when I was 19 years old and saying that one day I would be giving a bio on myself that sounded like the one I just gave, I probably would have said you were crazy. Uh, cause at the time I was working part time as a grocery store checker, uh, you know, making like, I think $13 an hour, uh, working 32 hours a week, uh, and becoming, a the CEO of a large, uh, real estate firm was probably the farthest thing from my mind. Although I I knew that I had this uh, this love for real estate, I, I I had this love for business and ways that I could you know make money without you know quote you know working for the man right. And uh, so the the first property that I bought was uh, a mobile home here in California. I don't remember the price. It was like probably. Hundred, around a hundred grand or something, you know, this is a long time ago. So you could actually buy stuff at that price. And I bought it with no money down uh, because I didn't have any money to put down. If, if there was no other option for me, I couldn't have done it uh, if I would have had to come with money out of my pocket. And, and literally the, the next deal I did after that, I bought by cash advance and credit cards and, you know, using the credit card money to, you know, pay the seller $1,500 walking money in exchange for a deed to the property and taking over the existing financing that was in default, uh, fixing up the house, uh, you know, using the credit card money to cure the default, 
so that we could keep it long enough to fix it up and resell it before the lender actually foreclosed. You know, those are the types of ways that I had to, you know, kick and scratch to get my entrance into this business. Uh, so, you know, for those that are listening, thinking I'm trying to figure out how to do my first deal or how to get my second deal, you know, believe me, I can relate to that. I was there once and never would have imagined that that would ever lead to this, but it, it can. Hmm. Yeah, I, like it's really fascinating. And, you know, <clears throat> one of the fascinating things was that you actually went, you took that risk, right? Because you made a whopping 1500 on that first flip you just, you just talked about. <laughs> so, That's true. Yeah. So, you know, you really took that risk, right? And yes, you, you always say this like, fine, you maybe don't make as much money, but it's not always about the money you learn, right? <clears throat> So can you talk a little bit more about having that mindset of folks starting in and thinking I have to start in, in my first year, I'm going to make $50,000 because I heard this from this wholesaling guy on the podcast. What do you say to that kind of mindset and how can we reframe that thinking? Well, I think it's great to, uh, you know, have profit as a motive and to, and to let that drive you towards your goal and, and say, Hey, and I'm going to go and, invest in this property, you know, because I'm going to make money. Now, I also think what tends to happen for a lot of people and while most uh, budding real estate investors fail is because they don't set proper expectations. So in other words, what happens is they say, I'm going to go, I'm going to do this deal. I'm going to make 50,000, uh, you know, and then they make 500 and they think I'm a total failure. I can't get this to work. I'm just going to give up now, or maybe they lose money. Um, you know, and it's uh, the, the proper expectation is I'm going to do this deal because I'm going to learn a lot. Uh, I'm going to build a track record. I'm going to show people I can do this. Now, if you make money on it, that's great. That to me, that's kind of secondary. Um, you know, hopefully you do make money and obviously we're in this for a profit motive, you know, and while I'm the first guy to tell people nowadays, it's like, look, you know, I don't need practice and experience. I do this for a living. Uh, when you're new, uh, you do need practice and experience. And if that's all you get out of a deal, that's a success. Take that success and build off of it because the next one might be the one where you make 50,000 or maybe you make 100,000 and you get 50 over two deals and that's the way it averages out. But it, you'll make zero money in real estate if you don't actually get out there and invest in real estate. I love that. You got to actually jump into the game and participate and play. So one of the, one of the most profound quotes that you actually mentioned was change. If you want to change your situation, change your, your vocabulary. I think that is so deep and I know it's kind of leading us into multifamily. Can you just talk a little bit more about that and how that directly affected you as we we're coming up? Well, you know, this business is, is about relationships. And so, you know, the way you become successful in this business is having people believing in you. And that might mean the seller believes in you that you're actually going to close the deal. It could be that simple. It might mean that the broker believes that you're going to close the deal or that the lender believes you're going to pay their loan back. Uh, and ultimately, one day, uh, whether sooner or later, it may mean that an investor that's going to invest money in your deal believes that you're going to be able to execute the business plan successfully, as you said you would do. So regardless of what relationship you're trying to, to build, your ability to build that relationship and build that confidence is partly dependent upon the way you talk about what it is you're going to set out to do. And so, you know, if you're like, you know, if you don't know the, the real estate lingo and the vocabulary, uh, people are going to pick up on that and think, you know, this guy doesn't know what he's talking about. So therefore I don't believe he's going to close, or I don't believe he's going to pay back my loan, or I don't believe he's going to execute the business plan uh, and, you know, make money on my investment. And I'm not saying that you got to go out there and speak in jargon. I mean, you, nobody wants to, you know, listen to somebody uh, talking in code. I mean, you, you want to be, you know, understandable, but at the same time, uh, you know, you want to be able to uh, communicate from a point of knowledge and people are going to ask you, you know, interesting and difficult questions that you don't want to misunderstand their question and not answer it properly because you didn't understand the words they were using. 
so expanding that vocabulary enables you to not only sound smart, but be smart. Uh, and that helps you build those relationships that you need to succeed. Yeah, that's a really good segue for us into multifamily. So initially you started buying things that, you know, foreclosure auctions and, you know, you know like you mentioned your flips and then you said, hey, I'm, you know, I did for the mobile home. Am I going to multifamily? So what really helped you during those times, you know, because you were kind of, I mean, you mentioned as well that you didn't have the internet, right? Unlike our generation we have, we could just Google everything. So how was that process for you and how did you keep going and how did you make that successful transition into kind of flipping into multifamily. Yeah, you know, it's true. You know, back then you, you couldn't just get on, you know, Google Maps and do a street view drive by of a property four hours away and get a sense of the neighborhood. You actually had to go there and see it in person. And so the, the tools that we have today, while they're incredible, uh, you know, the fundamentals of real estate are still kind of the same thing. This really is a tactile business where you have to be able to, you know, touch that real estate and shake the hand of your investor and, you know, and all those different things. So, you know, I kind of operate the same way today that I did then. I just have the ability to leverage my time a little bit better by, by using some tools. Uh, but the way that I made that segue was uh, I was buying uh, homes at the foreclosure auction, you know, for mostly I was a flipper. Uh, I, I didn't really believe too strongly in the buy and hold, you know, philosophy, at least here in California, because of numbers and, you know, a variety of reasons. But I still made a commitment that every once in a while, as I was buying these properties, I was going to keep one. And I did. And I started keeping a few of them. And, and a, a short time into this, probably a year or two into this, uh, I you know, was looking at this 1031 exchange as a potential way to grow um, my business without paying a huge hit on taxes. And so I sold two of my single family rentals and did a 1031 exchange into a 16 unit apartment building. And, you know, I did this by, you know, talking with a, a local broker that had been selling a lot of my flips. He was a CCIM which is the Certified Commercial Investment uh, Manager or something like, I don't know what the M stands for, but it's basically a broker that sells commercial real estate. Uh, the, uh, he taught me how to read a, a, a T12 and what an APOD was and how to look at the income statement. And, you know, because he wanted to sell me some real estate and he knew that I, I needed to know what I was looking at. So uh, he showed me an apartment building and ultimately ended up buying that apartment building. And that was my entry into multifamily. And, uh, and then I, I grew it from there. I did it again in 2005. The market in California was ridiculous. And I thought, you know, something's about to come crashing down. I need to go find some real estate somewhere out of California in a market that never moves. Maybe it never goes up, but it won't go down. And I ended up finding a, uh, this great property in Buffalo, New York, of all places, in a market that just, you know, in my opinion, never really moved much. So I, I bought that deal. And when the world collapsed around us, that thing performed like a dream. It didn't go down in value. It actually went up in value. And that was, you know, my entry into doing multifamily out of state. And, uh, and then I just, uh, you know, when, when I started raising money from investors after the market collapsed, uh, I knew that I needed to tap into those two skills of buying multifamily and buying out of state and leverage that into the business that I have today. I mean, there's so many questions, right? First and foremost, before we even talk about like, how do you, you know, pick your market and, you know, the different market, you know, dynamism going on and are we expecting the crash? There's so many questions in that, right? But I kind of wanted to jump to almost like the obvious ones, right? So you, like you said, you 1031 exchanged your couple of single families. You bought the 16 unit and you did it again. Market was getting hot. I'm guessing you waited for the recession and then you started buying, right? But my question is when you started syndicating, right? How were you able to get investors, especially during that economic times that, you know, that we're in, how did you get people to invest with you? How did you find money to kind of grow your, your business? Well, the, uh, it's funny you asked that question in particular because raising money in the midst of a recession and especially an economic collapse is damn near impossible. It's, it's one of the most difficult things you can ever do. But remember, uh, I started in 1989 
uh, the collapse was in you know 2005, six, and seven is when the uh, the heat of the downturn was in progress. That was when the falling knife was falling. So you know between those those two times, you know there's uh, you know there's a lot of years there, uh, 15, 15 plus years, 16, 17 years. So over that time, uh, you know I'd raised a couple of small funds you know i did one when i left my job i raised a 500 dollars 500 thousand dollar blind pool fund uh, that i used to fund my acquisitions into buying properties at the courthouse steps uh, and you know people started you know they knew that i would take investments and word got around and you know i had a, a little bit of an audience to start from uh, and initially that's really what it was, was I would go to that audience and, and get investments. And then, you know, that led to, you know, buying a lot of deals. And then I partnered up with this other guy. Uh, he had a few investors. So, you know, we expanded into that, that allowed us to buy even more. And, you know, then we suddenly became the most active buyer in the entire county. And that got us news coverage. And, you know, now the press was, you know, we're front page articles on a Sunday real estate section in the San Francisco Chronicle talking about what we were doing. Uh, you know, that's a major market newspaper and, you know, articles in the business section of our local uh, newspaper. And, and that got us a lot of attention where people would reach out and say, hey, I read about what you guys are doing in the newspaper. You know, I want to invest. And, you know, it just kind of one thing led to another and it just grew and fed upon itself. Uh, so I always say that, you know, activity breeds interest. And, you know, the more you can do, the more people are interested in what you're doing. If you're not doing anything, no one cares. Activity breeds interest. I, I love that. Brilliant. Brilliant. So um, real quick, let's just touch on one thing and then we have to go in the quick rounds um, as much as I want to keep going. So there's a lot of talk that there's another recession or correction. And of course, I, don't ex I know you don't have a, you know, a crystal ball. If you do, let me know. Um, <laughs> what, what are your thoughts on that, sir? What do you think? Well, you know, I, the uh, arguably the economy is a, sip, a cyclical being, yes, and and you know it it has its up times and it has its down times. Well, the problem is is that it whether it's going up or going down, it can look much different from the last time it did the same thing. So, you know, the next up market might look different from the last one. The next down market can look different than the last one. And I think that's the case here. Uh, our last down cycle was an enormously painful down cycle uh, resulting from a mortgage crisis that really impacted real estate. It impacted construction. Uh, by mere virtue of that, that impacted jobs and unemployment because construction and real estate and finance were major industries. And then it just kind of it snowballed out of control from there. Uh, it was the deepest recession I've seen in my lifetime, and it's the deepest one I expect I'll ever see in my lifetime. Now, that doesn't mean there won't be another one. I just think that the next time you see what we might call a down cycle is going to look a lot different. It might look like a slowing of price increases. It might mean a slight drop, you know, with a, a subsequent rebound. Uh, I just don't think you're going to see you know, a 50% decline in real estate values. And for those who are out there waiting for that to happen, uh, you may be waiting your entire life to see that to happen because I, I waited my whole life for it. I invested in real estate for 18 years before it was like, yes, our day is finally here. And, you know, it was, it was a season that made our business. And uh, I, don't expect, uh, I don't expect to see that again anytime soon. Okay. Yeah, I, I lied. I said we're going to go to the quick run. There was one question I have to ask. I think, correct me if I'm, if I'm, if I'm wrong, I think you made a million, was it 10 million? I think it was a million dollars on a deal, right? Was it a million dollars? There was one I posted about, we made 800,000 on one flip. Yes. Can you yeah, tell us a little bit more about, about that? Yeah, that was uh, that was a deal at you know at the peak of the crisis. It was uh, 2010 or 2011. Uh, it was in Austin, Texas. It was a 54 unit multifamily property that was bank owned. Subsequent to a foreclosure, uh, 
it had been on the market for a million six. It was in escrow at a million three or four or five or six. I don't remember which. The buyer canceled for whatever reason. The deal fell apart. Uh, so anyway, it went back on the market for a million six. Uh, I made an offer for 800,000, which was quickly refused. Uh, and then, you know, the broker kept calling me like week after week after week, want to know if I was still interested. And of course I was still interested, but only at 800,000. And it took about uh, maybe a month or two months before finally my offer was accepted. I never moved. Um, and we got the deal done at 800,000. We put another 800,000 into it. So we were into it for a million six and we ended up selling it for uh, I forget now, like two five or two two four fifty or something like that. Uh, it was a, it was a really good deal. We ended up we ended up with a net profit of about eight hundred thousand on that one flip. It took twenty one months from start to finish. Wow. Yeah. I mean, I look at deals all day long, and yeah, one will be hard pressed to 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 find those, those kinds of deals. I mean, they're, I'm sure they're out there, but. Yeah, I look at good. deals all day long too, and I don't see them either. <laughs> you know, we, we've been looking to repeat that performance ever since we we did it, and we have yet to do that. Probably never will again. You know, it's one of those kinds of things that there, there's there's these lifetime deals that you get. You know, everybody gets one in their lifetime, and there's you know, and you wait and wait and wait to ever see it again, and you just you never see it. It's it's very rare. You know, most deals are much more vanilla than that. Uh, those are great stories to motivate people to want to invest in real estate. Uh, but they're also really bad stories because people get in this situation where they feel like, gosh, I wasn't able to do what I heard the guy on the podcast do. So I'm doing something wrong or, you know, I failed at this business and, and they give up or quit. That's the wrong approach to take. Yeah. And I try to have a balance on my podcast um, as well, but it's so tough because then you don't want to like, you know, push people before they even start out of the game, but you want to be as realistic as, as you can, you know, that, Hey, this is really difficult. Like it's really hard, you know, um, if it was, it is really, really hard. Yeah. You know, if it was easy, everybody would be doing it. So, you know, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, as much as I want to keep going, we have, we're definitely, definitely dwelling into the quick rounds. Is that going to be quick questions? Quick answer. You ready? I'll try. <laughs> All right. First question. What makes you, Brian, unique? What is that differentiating factor that separates you from the next girl or the next guy? Uh, only thing I could think of is that I started with absolutely no money, no knowledge, no connections, uh, and literally living paycheck to paycheck, and managed to build a you know several hundred million dollar uh, real estate business out of it. I don't know very many people that have done that. Yeah, totally agree. Um, second question, what was the last book that you read and what was the one thing that you picked up from that book? The last book that I read, oh man. Uh, the Actually, oh, I do know what it was. It was, uh, uh, I forget the name of it even. It was about, uh, it was written by a Navy, a former Navy SEAL. And it was about, uh, you know, having a strong, a strong mind. And uh, gosh, I wish I could remember the title of it. Now I'm gonna have to look at it and email you what it was. Cause uh, okay. it, was, it was actually, it was actually pretty good. It was, it was, it was just about, you know, mental toughness and uh, having a, having a strong mind. And, and nobody has a stronger mind, I think, than, uh, than a Navy SEAL. So oh, uh, absolutely. I'll have to get back to you on what that was called. Cause I forget. Okay. I think I have a, I think I have an idea. I think the guy has a podcast too. I think it's Jack or something. I can't remember. Yeah. I think I have an idea. Anyway. Um, last question. I mean, you're running Praxis Capital, fantastic company. And I, you know, just, um, look at your website. I'm like, this is the future. I, you know, great company. You've got all this, um, you know, deals that you're, you know, looking, um, that you're managing all these assets. I'm sure you got family too. What do you do for fun? Uh, I fly airplanes. That's what I do for fun. Uh, huh. Yeah, I fly airplanes. I've been doing it. I got my license when I was in high school. I used all the money I made bagging groceries every week to take one flying lesson every week and got my license. I think originally because I thought I was going to be an airline pilot, but when I realized I didn't have the money to do all the flight training required to become an airline pilot, I guess I chose real estate instead. Uh, but I still really enjoy flying. 
Yeah, and I read you you missed by like half a point on the course to be an air um, traffic controller. I, I read about that. That was that was interesting. It yeah, was that was, yeah. When I when I thought I didn't have enough money to be a, an airline pilot, I thought, well, maybe I could be an air traffic controller. But uh, you know, that was a tough test. And yeah, I think I missed it by like a point or something like that. It was crazy. Right. Well, I'm glad. I'm glad you you know you didn't do that because we get to learn from you every day. Um, Everything happens for a reason. <laughs> exactly, it's destiny, right? Um, yep. So, if there's like a, a dwell listener listening on our conversation or a fly on the wall, and they're like, "I love what Brian is," never, you know, I want to connect with Brian, I want to follow him. Where are you most active, and where can people learn from you? Now, uh, really, there's really only one place, and that's BiggerPockets.com. I'm I'm active on that website. I post answers to questions on that website. Uh, every once in a while, I write articles for their blog, uh, and uh, you know, potentially might even be doing some additional things with them here in the near future. So we can watch for that. But uh, that's really the one place where uh, you'll be able to get the most interaction for sure. Brian, it's been a, an absolute pleasure. Um, I cannot even believe you you were you're here on our show. Thank you so so much. I really appreciate you you know taking time out today. Absolutely. Thank you for the invitation. I appreciate it and I enjoyed being here. Thank you.